Thanks for listening to the AZ Wildcats podcast post game show. I am your host, Mike Luke. All right, with the very flashy John Schuster with Snuffy in the background, Ben One White. All right, now, Arizona, that talk about a tale of two halves, everybody. Um, Arizona looks like, uh, you know what, we're just going to give up a bunch of three point shots and uh, hope that they start missing open shots. Keyshaw Johnson gets hurt. Second half, Arizona comes out and they absolutely annihilate Stanford. Um, Guys, what was the reasoning behind that? Because we were going to talk about this. Wow, there's a lot to digest there. What was the reasoning? There's a, uh, to Arizona's credit, in the second half, clearly they were, uh, obviously, they were a lot better. What'd they give up? 25 points in the second half and, right. you know, 20 points over the course of the first 18 minutes or something like that. So, so the defense, which had escaped Arizona uh, for three halves against Stanford, finally was able to step up. And I think a lot of that uh, was pretty obviously the Wildcats' willingness for longer stretches of time to play a more athletic, defensive, perimeter-oriented unit. It was pretty clear in this matchup that Lewis was a difference maker. Bradley was significantly helpful as well, but uh, Lewis was exceptional today. And it's that type of play that allows Arizona, I think, to do what it does best when it can cause havoc on the perimeter. Then they can get some easy buckets uh, in the open floor and I think ultimately be significantly more effective. I'll be honest with you though, in the first half, and I, I I suspect others felt the same way. There was a lot of, at what point do you get to the point where you start to recognize that what it is that you're doing ain't working. And, and so, you know, at what point do you stop being stubborn and try to make an adjustment that I think a lot of folks could probably, you know, at least you wanted to go to against a team like Stanford, because Stanford, the way it is against Arizona starting five, Stanford isn't a very good basketball team, but they're a bad matchup for Arizona uh, because they can stretch the floor as well as they can. And that puts a lot of pressure on Crevis and Ballo and then extends things across the board uh, for the rest of that group, which means that you're going to have to do something different. And it seemed to take a while for Arizona to finally get into difference mode. And by utilizing the athleticism that it has on the roster. I think it took that to finally be successful. Yeah, Ben, it, it is weird that, like I said, when, uh, when Arizona went with the lineup where you had Jaden Bradley, uh, uh, KJ Lewis, uh, Caleb Love, Pella Larson, and uh, Umar Ballo, leader of men, that was the best lineup out there. That was the one that really, and it was without Boswell, without Keyshaw Johnson. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, you don't win this game today if, if Lewis and, and Bradley don't go out there and play the way they did. And I, I'm really ready to start having the conversation about sitting Boswell down for Bradley um, when it comes to the starting point guard. He, for whatever reason, just doesn't look right on both sides of the ball. There's limitations there. There's a confidence issue from a shooting standpoint. He's not very consistent at all. And he's kind of been a liability for Arizona the majority of these last um, couple of months. Yeah. And we've talked about the shooting slumps and all of that, but it, it just hasn't translated to some consistency here. And I know he had a great game on Thursday, but outside of that, the sample size kind of tells you what you need to know about him. And I think the concerning part for Arizona is obviously, look, you rebounded there in the second half. You outscored them by well over double digits, but this team's identity is playing inside out. And when you have Keisha Johnson playing as shaky as he is, um, not very consistent. I get that he got injured. He injured his shoulder there early in the game. It seemed like he wasn't right. The coaching staff did pull him to your point. But when you have a shaky front court, Johnson, who's very inconsistent, and a point guard who, quite honestly, has lost his entire touch he's not confident at all i think you need to make a change there but when you have holes there at the point guard spot and you have holes there with johnson really worrisome this time of year because i don't think this is something after we watched arizona beat duke and beat michigan state and play neck to neck with purdue there for a good majority in that game i don't think a lot of us expected to be sitting here uh, the first week of February, having the conversation about Arizona's point guard, right, and and the issues we're having there. So yeah. Arizona bounced back. They got the win, but more concerns for me at this point. Yeah, I agree with that. I also think uh, we need to touch on K.J. Lewis here a little bit. My guy, K.J. Lewis, um, he brings an energy. He brings a a defensive factor that, that 
I don't know this really replicated on this team. And this really, I don't know if this was his breakout performance, but this I think was really kind of the performance where I think a lot of people were just like, you kind of took note where you're like, whoa, this dude, this guy can do a lot of things. And what's also really nice about KJ Lewis as well is that he doesn't need the ball. You've got guys that need the ball. Caleb Love needs to have the ball to be able to do a lot of what he does. KJ Lewis just kind of does it by being KJ Lewis, John Schuster. In an odd way, he's the, if you want to use the Tommy Lloyd Gonzaga, you know, style example, Lewis to me is the most Gonzaga player on this roster. Uh, the best, I think, at cutting without the ball, uh, which helps Arizona's movement on the offensive end. Now, there are still, I think, clearly limitations to his offensive game. And I think that's part of the problem at this, at this stage. And I think it's part of the area where there's a little bit, a uh, bit of discomfort in trying to figure out how many minutes you're going to get from him that are good before you get into law of diminishing return territory. Uh, and, and I don't know what that number is, but it looks like it certainly probably is going to continue to increase here, uh, which is obviously a good sign. Generally speaking though, I think that's the problem that you have with Lewis and Bradley at this stage, both definitely give Arizona a, an uptick on the defensive end from a perimeter standpoint, but both appear to me to be inconsistent on the offensive end at this stage. But let me, so, let me ask you this, shoot. Let me ask you this though, shoot uh, with Boswell though. Boswell's giving you nothing on offense. Well, I'm not, but, but um, that's true, but you're faced with an issue where your backup example isn't what you'd like to have at this stage. Right. So it's not a clear cut. And, and, and I think, there may be two things going on. I'm going to armchair philosophize here a little bit with Lloyd. Lloyd wants Boswell to get good because I think at this stage, you don't put him in the game as often as you do. If you don't think you're trying to work through confidence or something like that. And, or he believes maybe in what I suggested in regards to not thinking long, long term in extended minutes that Lewis and Bradley give Arizona the potential offensively that he thinks they need in the half court. Uh, so while I don't disagree with what you guys are saying, I am curious if Arizona goes in that direction, uh, whether we see that Lewis is at Lewis and Brad, let, 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 let's use Bradley first, just for sake of argument, that Bradley's a good 12 minute a game guy. But once he gets into minute 15 and minute 18 and minute 20, maybe you see some effectiveness diminish a little bit. And if Lewis is a guy who's good at 20, who, you know, maybe falters a little bit if he gets to 25 at this stage, I don't know. But it seems to me that that is an air, per, possible area of concern. At one of Arizona's strengths was coming into this year, you're going to have love, you're going to have Boswell, you're going to have an ability to maybe almost do hockey line type of exchanges where Lewis and Bradley can come in games and give you a boost offensively. And with Boswell struggling as much as he has, that certainly diminishes Arizona's advantage from a perimeter depth standpoint. And I think that's something that Lloyd is still trying to work through with Boswell, even as frustrated as it's, as frustrating as it clearly is at this stage. Ben one white. Well, I mean, the reality is when you look at what Boswell's done offensively since um, the game before Christmas, Mike, we've played about 15 games here, 20 games here over the course of the conference season. Boswell's only scored double digits in five of those games. Right. Um, and I think that's the concerning part. I think the shoes point. Yeah. Are there some limitations with Bradley? Is he not as far along as you would expect or and or like at this point. Yeah, because look, he wasn't expected to come in and be flirting with the idea of, of playing more than probably 20 minutes a game, right? I mean, that's the reality of it. And kind of in a tough position at this point in the year because I, I get sitting down Boswell to my point a little bit earlier, but at the same time, if you do that, it can go one of two ways. A, you either lose the kid altogether or B, it, it, it sparks him and kind of ignites some motivation or something there that's missing. But at the same time, like you watch him out on the court from a matchup standpoint and just play after play, right? It, it does show at times that he just may not be good enough. And I think he has the intangibles. I think he has the skill set to, to be good. And we've certainly seen it at times, but it's just really frustrating up to this point that we're having this conversation. Um, but, but to your point earlier, right? If, if he's not giving you at least 10 points a game, which 
has been pretty, pretty lacking the last month and a half, then I kind of think you need to see more of Bradley and just see what he can do. And every time I'll say this too, every time Bradley and Lewis get on the court for Arizona, I think they're showing you a little bit more growth and upside versus somebody like Boswell, because they're obviously younger. Um, they're not developed into the full type of player at this point, just because they're freshmen. And I get that Boswell is young as well, but I'm sorry, man. Like the dynamic just changes when those two get into the game. And I, I really do believe um, if, if Arizona doesn't throw Lewis and Bradley and go with that lineup there in the second half, that Arizona's p potentially and, and likely losing this game. They just are. Kevin Woodman. All right. The great Kevin Woodman. Ben's facial hair makes him look like a guy on the <laughs> wire. I am the, first of all, that is vintage cat. Uncle Kev. Yes. Second of all, I am. Well, I think I speak for everybody on this panel. Kevin Woodman is awake right now. Generally, we think of Kevin Woodman as being asleep by about 6.30 p.m. and up at about 2.45 a.m. This is correct, John Schuster and Ben White. Well, I think, uh, you know, beyond that correction, the thing that uh, is, you know, uh, is, is showcased a little bit more here is just how humble Ben White is. Because if Ben White has facial hair from the wire, he probably ought to have about 38 Emmys that went with that as well. And he isn't showcasing any of them. That is the coolness that Ben White brings to this broadcast. Not just from a facial hair standpoint, but from a general attitude standpoint. Hey, this is I got to be grateful theme. because one of those Emmys comes from this show. So I'll take what I can get. I still love the comment the other day about Ben's professionalism in this entire uh, in this entire chaotic show is very impressive. Um, okay, now... Um, as far as the uh, uh, get back to it, we need we, we need to stay in the point guard play here for a second. I get that. And I think it was Meisner that made the point where Boswell's got a higher upside than Bradley. At what point, though, do we stop just trying to play through this and get Boswell to I mean, the, the season, as weird as this is, uh, the Pac-12 tournaments in five weeks here. I mean, we got to figure something. They got to figure something out because right now, like I said, Boswell is giving them absolutely nothing. Okay, and so are you in favor of going in that direction? I think there are two follow up. There, you know, there are a couple follow up questions here. If if you believe that Bradley is the answer at point guard, whether that's a temporary I, fix or a long, I don't. Fix, I no, I don't. Okay, then what do you do? That well, that's what I'm saying, and that's why I'm that's why I'm not very smart. That's obviously why I'm not smart. I don't know what I do here. I like Bradley. I think I'm a little bit bigger on Bradley than you, but at the same point, your your point is well taken though about the offense. Um, if you have Bradley and KJ Lewis out there, they're only scoring off hustle type stuff. They're not going to be able to. And I do believe that the Boswell that we saw against say Duke earlier in the season is what Arizona needs, but this just isn't happening. And I think that's what I think that's what's so concerning about this, fellas, is that it's not happening and it doesn't look like it doesn't look like I mean, his confidence out there is shot. I mean, yeah. and it looks it. I mean, you guys are right. I'm not I'm not, you know, necessarily the the point that I'm generally making isn't an attempt to try to defend the performance of Boswell. It's clearly indefensible at this stage. It's frustrating. And even in college. You want to do the support thing. You want to do whatever you can to try to get him there. But there's also a realization that I think the coaching staff believes that they need Boswell for Arizona to maximize whatever its potential is come tournament time. And I think there's a little bit of a concern there without him. You know, how much are you ultimately at this stage? I'm not, I don't yeah. have anything against Bradley at all. I don't have, I, I, Lou Lewis obviously has a great skill set, but. You know, the, I, I think there's a recognition that there may be limitations to what their game is. And the more minutes that you play, possibly the more problems that you get into, especially with consistency on the offensive end. And those are concerns that this team has. And if that's just where you are, then you're going to have to be a little bit more inventive in how you try to figure out how you're going to score on that end of the floor uh, to give Arizona opportunities to win games to make the run that we hope they're capable of doing. I think a big concern, though, also is when you look at you, listen, we've never really discussed this aspect. What kind of flooring do you think that Kylan Boswell has at his place? Well, unfortunately, it's not Empire. If it was, things might be trending in a much more positive direction. You know, and that's why I think Ben White is able to make this show go. If you see Ben's got great floors at his place. Ben's floors are amazing. I, I, ben, if they're not Empire, don't tell me because they look like they are Empire flooring. They are absolutely fantastic. Either way, check it out. Kylan Boswell, this is for you as well. Check out Empire flooring. <laughs> Schedule a free in-home estimate. All listeners can receive $350 off discount when they use the promo code P. 
PHNX. Restrictions apply. See empiretoday.com slash PHNX for details. Also, he's not old enough, but do you think that there's a chance that he's gone to the Gila River Casino? Oh, I, I, he, he, it'd be disappointing if he hadn't just to check out the beauty of that facility. Yes. And the little waves that we saw mm. from the, when we were, everybody loves the waves. You do, hey, you do you. All right. Yeah. You do you, as the kids say, you do you at Gila river resorts and casinos. Visit play for more details. Maybe you'll see cool people there. I don't know. We'll check it. We'll check it out. At an um, Arizona coyotes game. I saw the, you do you guy. He was Did a really? main fe- yeah, he was a main feature there at an Arizona Coyotes game that I checked out. Huge, Are- huge, momentous uh occasion uh and, and, and event as far as I was concerned in my overall lifetime. Jervis Which Williams, the great Jervis Williams. Where are you at, Jervis? Oh, come back here. All right. I think Crevis is a monster next year. I agree. Schuster Ben, um, Schuster Ben, that's a great name. Um <laughs> Not Schuster really. uh, has been talking about how he really thinks that Crevis is kind of a key to this team and being able to get him. And he didn't like when Crevis wasn't playing a ton earlier this year. Ben White, you see it though. Uh, Umar Ballo, leader of men, can do some very good things. But Crevis also has a little bit of a, uh, it's, it feels weird to see this. Crevis is a little bit more fleet of foot than Umar Ballo. And I don't know that anybody's ever looking at Crevis and saying that that's Mike Luke's lateral <laughs> movement right there. <laughs> Well, I think he's definitely a little bit more active when it ter- when it comes to defense and things you can do with him. I think Ballo Abalo is great at, at blocking shots, obviously, right? You and corrected you yourself. I did. You yes. noticed that remark, Shoe, Ben. Shoe, Shoe, Shoe was the saying Ballo as well. So it's, it's a group effort. We're working to correct ourselves. Eventually, we'll get the player names right on this show one day. Ah, we'll um, get it, man. It's chaos either way. Yes, yes, exactly. But no, I, I think with Crevis, right, I think the challenge you have at this point is I'd like to see him dunk a little bit more. Um, I'd like to see that ability. But defensively, look, his, his feet are a lot more active. He can move. Ballo is limited in that sense. And every time he gets in the game, right, I think Arizona is, is active in the front court and that's what I was a little bit frustrated with especially there in that first half I know Boswell had the three and then Love hit the three but if you're Arizona man you don't want to go toe-to-toe with a team like this that can shoot the way they can and even on top of that you don't want to be a team that's going to beat people from the perimeter that's just not how this team is built you have players like Love who can do that per se but to me you need to get Balo going you need to get Krivis going God, you need to get Johnson going somehow. Obviously, that's tough if he's injured moving forward. But this team is just built to beat people up front. And I don't understand the hesitation at times to go inside out, to go to the paint early on. And granted, they did it tonight in the second half, what, 48 to 24 advantage in the paint. So eventually it it led on. But man, just be aggressive from the get-go. Get those guys going early. Um, As good as love is, right? He's not going to win you. I mean, he's going to win you games at times and everybody's struggling. We've we've certainly seen that. And, and God knows where this team would be at times without Caleb Love. But at the same time, you've got so many weapons and abilities up front to, to score and really set the tone. And I think defensively, maybe that's where you're seeing some of those challenges with Arizona because it seems at times, and you saw it tonight, Um, especially in the guard sport and the guard spot, those guys just seem to take possessions off defensively. It's, It's on or off. It's very inconsistent. I definitely think there's a confidence issue when somebody like Basel isn't hitting shots because that translates to the rest of his game. And he has shown at times, right, that he can be effective on defense, but that just hasn't been the case. And it kind of feeds on to the rest of that game because, I know Stanford hit some crazy shots and, and we'll get to Jones, but there were a number of plays where they had some pretty wide open looks. And I think if you're Arizona, it's an easy thing to tighten up. I'm not sure why guys are getting lost in rotation, why guys are getting lost on switches and screens. But to me, I mean, this perimeter defense, we've talked about it for weeks now, but this was a big frustrating element in this game as well. Ben, you're smarter than all of us and you made the greatest point right there possible. Why is this still a problem? I get that it was better in the second half, but listen, I know that Stanford, they shot lights out again, but a lot of those threes were wide open, Schuster. Not all of them, I get it, but you give teams like Stanford that don't have a lot of players that can make plays off the bounce, you give them open threes, guess what? When they start making it, then they get a little bit more confidence. They get a little bit more shimmy. Um, 
Arizona's got to figure this one out because this is how you lose in March when you just give up open threes to teams that are overmatched. Well, unfortunately, a lot of the problem with Arizona, I think uh, Arizona's dominance on the inside, I think hurts them with teams that can spread the floor on the offensive end. And, and while Stanford, again, is not a particularly good basketball team, they match up in a way that's a problem for this incarnation of Arizona. So if you can... If you can stretch Ballo out to the perimeter and force him to defend from out there, then you've got one of two choices and neither of them are good. You're either going to try to shoot the three, and if you're a good three-point shooter, he's going to have to give it to you, or you're going to have to beat him off the dribble because you've opened the floor. Uh, and and we've all, we're have we well aware of limitations from an overall footwork standpoint that makes things uh, difficult. Uh, Crevis is the same way. Right now, those are not strengths for Arizona's inside game. So if they come up against a team that can open the floor like this, I think it's going to be a problem. And what Arizona is going to have to make adjustments defensively, which probably involves going to a smaller, more athletic lineup to try to negate that a little bit. And it would not necessarily surprise me if you see uh, guys like Lewis uh, Johnson, if he's healthy, and the Johnson situation... I don't know how concerning it is, but if it's a long-term problem, Arizona's got, I think, significant overall problems as well. Uh, and and he was obviously a little, uh, obviously the shoulder thing or the bicep thing, whatever it was, caused some wonkiness. Hopefully that is not a long-term thing and, and that there isn't something else going on. Arizona needs his athleticism because with a guy like Johnson, with a guy like Lewis, and then with a guy like Bradley, they're all hustle guys. And that gives Arizona um, so much more athleticism and I think general versatility. So there are going to be matchups where I think the Cats are going to have to go small and probably smaller for longer than Lloyd would prefer. But, uh, you, you know, if you wanted, if you're a team out there defending Arizona, and obviously a lot of this has to do with, you know, what kind of personnel you have. But if you're scouting the Cats, you're watching a lot of Stanford video right now because they have the blueprint for you. They're not a very good basketball team, and they were better than Arizona for three quarters, uh, three halves this year. Uh, so if you're a if you're a team in the tournament that has that kind of skill set, you can see a path toward making things a lot more difficult against the Cats than you know a, a, a lot of Wildcat fans would probably prefer. Ben, to me, Keyshaw Johnson, not Keshad, Keyshad, Keyshaw Johnson. Though we've got to he. It's, it's really like, well, listen, with Boswell, Boswell's confidence is just shook. It is what it is yeah. at this point. With Keyshaw Johnson, though, Keyshaw Johnson has to be that difference maker that we talked about, that somebody that I think, I don't know if it was Shue or not, that was saying that you saw a little bit of Aaron Gordon in him and that mm -hmm. how he could defend multiple positions, kind of his strength is athleticism. That You need him back because he's the only big man on the roster that is strong and is physically able. Because, again, when you're dealing with uh, Umar Ballo, leader of men, and Krivas, you're dealing with guys that kind of move in molasses. You, Keyshaw Johnson, they've got to figure it out. And it's a little concerning to me, to be honest with you, that they were – that they were that Arizona's defense was significantly better without Keyshaw Johnson in there in the second half. That that's a little worrisome to me. Yeah, and you put that out there, and I I totally echo it, right? Because he is that versatile forward, and and to the point earlier about perimeter defense and Arizona switching, and the problem when you go inside is it opens things up. It opens things up for other teams to make outside shots. He's really the only guy you have that has the ability to switch and defend. Um, with the way that Stanford and some of these other teams who have had success against Arizona score because they do it from the perimeter. And I think that's the crazy part about it, too. When you talk about defense, he's somebody who should be the leader of this team. He should be that consistent, steady piece just because he's been playing college basketball for five years. And you all know well and good what type of player he is. He showed us at San Diego State. He has shown us in the biggest games. Um, look. If Arizona is going to beat a team like Duke, a team like Purdue, a team like Michigan State again, you can't have a game like this, right? You, you really can't have Keyshaw Johnson playing the way he has the last four and a half weeks, I think, if Arizona is going to do anything um, come March. And look, um, is he somebody offensively that relies a little bit more on the guards, I think, to get set up? Yeah, but at the same time, I think the concerning part, to your point, is defensively, He's just not as active, right? It seems like there's some inconsistency there. I really hope it's just an injury thing and an injury issue. And as frustrating as it is at this point in the season, 
you almost have to give him a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. It doesn't change the situation. It doesn't change the fact that he needs to shake out of whatever what's going on here. But, Mike, we've watched this guy for a long right. time, and he's given us every reason, and he's shown us every example as to what type of player he can be. And the last month or so is just really an odd outlier. Shoot, we've got a lot of people, uh, uh, males, females across the board, that are commenting on the shirt. We need to talk about the shirt, or as Ray called it, back the A-Ray, the drip. That's what the kids call it, the drip. Is Shoe that what is the kids call it? on business right now is the mm -hmm. another term that the kids say. Yeah, Shoe I've got Riz. Business. Where can they find this? Uh, they can find, uh, I, I. that's a damn good question, Pro probably through uh, some weird... Uh, uh, Chinese t-shirt companies because they don't have to worry about licensing and they can do whatever art they ultimately want. I am noticing, and it's mostly accidental, that there's really a lot of orange in my screen right now. Uh, so I don't know if that's a good thing or, you know, a blinding thing from some folks even beyond the usual Chrome issue. Uh, but, uh, y you know, I, I hope that you can tolerate that weird color scheme. But thank you immensely for the compliment i will continue to you know try to blind we folks with weird t-shirts we should get an we should get an auction going for this shirt <laughs> i think that was actually i think that you could actually make a fairly good amount of money uh, with this we should get an auction going with this it's an interesting uh, it's certainly it's certainly one of mike luke's many interesting thoughts all right there yeah there are many interesting thoughts um okay pella larson though another guy that you know pella does i Mulebach was messaging me this a while back, and he said, I don't know how Pella Larson doesn't get hurt, like seriously hurt. I've never seen anybody whose head goes smashing into the ground, whose shoulder looks like it dislocates 30 times on the stanchion. Ben, he's an interesting guy to watch because it looks like he's on the verge of falling apart every single time. Man, he, he plays doesn't. every basketball game like it's his last. I'll give him that. Um, but again, right, like, we talk about the guard play. We talk about defense and I think he's limited, but where I like him over Boswell and, and some of the other struggles we've seen with the other guards at times, right? He at least is giving effort on every single possession. You can't say Pella isn't out there not trying on defense and yeah. Are you going to get some boneheaded plays? Are, are there going to be frustrations probably at one point? every single game. Yeah. But again, right. I think offensively he does enough. He got you 17 tonight. He's had double digit scoring games. I think in terms of all the guards outside of love, right over the last month and a half, he's been by far and away the second most consistent, which I don't think a lot of us were expecting up until this point, but I just wish his energy and what he does in terms of defense. And it was even talking a little smack today. I was, I was surprised to see that, but I like the fire and I like the attitude from him. And I just wish guys like Boswell would get a little bit more pissed off, you know, when they miss shots, when they get lost on defense, instead of just sitting there and looking all timid and rigid and, you know, hit, slapping the face and shaking your head, like translate that energy into, into correcting what needs to be corrected. Right. And I think Larson is the prime example of that. And he's somebody that Lloyd can look on, look to on this roster and point at him and say, Hey, I want you guys to think more like this. Don't necessarily want you making all the plays he makes because he does get himself into trouble to your point. But I just really like his attitude. And when you're, when you're scrappy like him and you can put up the points that he can and, and be effective, I don't care how limited you may be at times, you're going to find a way to play. And he's a perfect example of that. Yeah, uh, we uh, back to the confidence thing for a second with Boswell. Basketball is, I think, the most brutal game when somebody doesn't have confidence because it's not like football where you can hide behind a helmet. That's for you, Kevin Woodman. Um, or uh, you know, you people see your emotions. People see when you're sinking. I always use this, and Ben One White was not Ben One White. When were you? Uh, when were you born? By the way, what year? Ninety six. Oh, okay. Well, you were alive. One then. of the oh. finest years in American history. But you, Ben One White probably does not remember this game, but you could see it like when the NCAA tournament uh, happened, uh, when the NCAA tournament happened, you could see even when Arizona won it or made the Elite Eight, you could see that uh, Michael Dickerson's confidence, you could just see it in his face. And Michael Dickerson is one of the best players that ever came through here, but you could see the confidence and there's nothing really you can do. I don't know from a coaching perspective, honestly, what you do when a player loses his confidence because it's out there for everybody to see. It's, um, it's difficult there, John Schuster. And this is why Lloyd's trying to play him. 
and right. trying to give him as much time as possible. Because Lloyd's trying to figure out the psychological dynamic of Boswell right now because I think he believes that Boswell can still contribute positively to this team and or he needs to contribute positively to this team for Arizona to get to where it wants to be and where we believe it can be. So the you know he has a handful of approaches and sometimes coaches can approach things one way or you know try something else and the the obvious reality here is if this is a game of uh you know performance and results Boswell isn't providing that right now but if you go the route of benching him uh for extended periods of time and opting for Bradley instead uh, then you have to hope that Boswell has the character and the wherewithal to be able to work his way through that. And maybe at this stage, Lloyd is a little uncertain that that's the case. Um, it would be, I, you know, you hope that in that situation, there's a mutual understanding that, dude, you got to get better. Whatever that involves behind the scenes during the game, whatever baby steps are necessary. And I thought he took baby, positive baby steps in about two out of the three games that Arizona has played over the course of the last couple of weeks, uh, where he was much more engaged defensively. And that then kind of works its way in a positive capacity uh, for Arizona on the offensive end. And then hopefully the offense comes around as a result of that. Obviously today, that was not the case. He was a mess. So, you know, you're in a position where you've got to try if, if version one didn't work, maybe you got to go to something else. But as you guys noted, you know, time is a factor here as well. So, but I think what you're seeing on the sideline is that Lloyd wants to do everything he can to keep Boswell involved and hope that Boswell is ultimately going to work his way through with that kind of support to get to where Arizona needs him to be. But it isn't working. It, it clearly isn't working consistently right now. So he may be faced with a fairly significant decision and we see how Boswell reacts if that's the case. I think there's some question, too, because we're talking about money being on the line, and a lot of people are talking about, you know, NBA, this, that, or the other. Well, I will tell you one thing. He's not going to be drafted to the NBA. But if he makes money, the Desert Financial Credit Union might be a spot for Kylan Boswell. This is correct. You both agree? Agreed. All right. Yes. All right. Well, yeah. All right. Now, when you open a free checking account online, get $200 in bonuses. Get started by visiting desertfinancial.com slash 200. Desert Financial Credit Union, my friends. Check it out. Now, let's go to the Desert Financial Credit Union segment by the numbers from the great Jacob Franklin. Okay. Um, Arizona won. They beat the crap out of them in the second half. Um, Stanford was shooting 89% from three-point range in the first half. That went down to 43 it still worries me, though. I don't like the three-point percentages they're giving up, but either way, Arizona did much better. What say? What do you guys think about these stats? Uh, you know, that's there's there's not a lot that jumps out out at you. I think uh, to a large degree, the response coming out of the Arizona uh, camp is going to be that this is a regression to the mean game that Stanford just can't shoot like this. And Arizona system is going to work over the course of 40 minutes, but it's instead it's games like this that uh, tend to concern me a little bit, because if you get hot and stick with a certain stubbornness, uh, instead of trying to figure out ultimately what's going to work for you, uh, then you're in a position where this can be a problem uh, in a single elimination tournament. I was much more pleased again, and I don't know that the stats necessarily are indicative of this. I think they are probably more so on the defensive end, that uh, Arizona, when it went to a more athletic lineup, was a lot more effective, clearly, uh, defensively, as opposed to what they did over the course of three halves against Stanford uh, in this matchup. But beyond that, I'm just glad Stanford's off the roster. Uh, right. I, I know it's weird, and I know it's frustrating. I know but they're, they're a bad, bad matchup for Arizona. They're just a bad matchup for Arizona, which, again, is concerning because they're not a particularly great basketball team that has – they aren't going to get anywhere near the tournament. But you wonder how many teams out there that are tournament-ready have the same sort of personnel that maybe the Cardinal does. And if that's the case, how many of those teams may Arizona come across and what problems could they, they potentially pose uh, in – you know, in a tournament matchup. Obviously, it's a lot of speculation and the rest of it. There there are probably other really good teams out there that struggle with some general matchup that comes across from them from a team that is uh, kind of a head scratcher. Uh, but just getting Stanford out of the way, trying to move on and figuring out what Arizona's next step is uh, becomes interesting. And certainly the road trip coming up for Arizona becomes uh, uh, 
quite an interesting challenge as well. Utah is a lot like Stanford in a lot of ways. Uh, and Arizona did a good job down here at McHale and utterly rolled Colorado. But uh, I think there's reason to believe you're not going to get the same result up in Boulder. So if the Cats can perform well, and we know they're capable, we know they're capable of doing that. But we know there are also going to be two difficult challenges on the docket as well. Ryan Hansen made this point. Great point right here as well. Uh, AJW, Ryan, Rhino made this point as well, where he said Arizona, when they attack the rim and they don't just settle for threes, is a far more difficult team because you've got guys that can get to the basket. And he said, not only do you have guys that can get to the basket, you have guys who are six foot five, six foot four, six foot six that are fairly strong and they can really cause stress for a team uh, when that when that happens, Ben. And that's exactly what happened there in that second half. Well, and that's the point we made off the top, right? I think that's the approach you have to take if you're Arizona, and I think that's your identity. Um, you play inside out. You get guys like Johnson and Ballo going early, and you just create havoc at the basket, and that, that's what they did to your point. And at times, I think it's tempting because when Love gets the ball, obviously he has the green light to shoot any shot he wants, as he should, because – he can make a number of different shots and even do things at the rim that the other guards just just can at this point. And I think the problem with that is it's a blessing and it's a curse because I think the blessing is obviously all the good that comes with it. But the curse is Boswell, Larson, some of these other guys, right? From a efficiency standpoint, there seems like there's times where Arizona just doesn't move the ball the way it needs to be moved. And you got to get the ball inside you got to do that early and you got to be consistent with it. You know, I think that's probably why we're seeing Johnson struggle at times, because I think Arizona's guards and just the way that the offense has been ran lately, um, you're not going to those guys as much as you should. And a team like Stanford, obviously they can shoot well from three, but tonight, as we've seen, you know, going back a month since we first played them as a, as a unit, their strength is from three, but their weakness is up front. I mean, there's not really a guy from a size standpoint, from a athleticism or defensive standpoint that can really slow down Arizona's bigs. And I was just basically puzzled in that first half as to why they didn't really understand that or go with that. Now, granted, they, they figured it out in the second half and um, you made things happen, but there were just too many times in this game, fellas, where it was a one possession game or a two possession game. And Arizona was playing from behind for quite a bit throughout this game. And to Shoe's point, they certainly weren't the better team uh, in that first half. So, yeah, like this team, I think, goes as far. You know, we talk about starting point guard play and Basel being as important. But, you know, this team goes as far as as Johnson and, and Balo in that front quarter are going to take them as well, because I just think. That's how they beat teams. You're not going to beat teams if you're Arizona getting into a three-point contest with whoever you're facing. You're just not. All right, Pugs and Hugs with the Super Snap. I uh, apologize. I did not see this earlier. I apologize. The Super Snap. Um, now, um, look ahead to the Mountain Schools because that's a that's a brutal trip. Um, this isn't like... Uh, and listen, Arizona's got to pick up some games here because if you want to get the number one seed, um, you know, you've got some bad losses at this point. Um, I, I guess you can uh, you can split with the mountain schools, but you can't get swept by the mountain schools. You either got to beat uh, and so you've at least got to split here, John Schuster. I see you actually agreeing with me. I like it. Yeah, it's hard to fathom. I know, but uh, yeah, uh, these are games that uh, because Arizona needs to stack some W's here to try to get some momentum, get back on track. Other teams ahead of them uh, are going to, you know, uh, drop some games that'll. You know, they probably shouldn't here and there. There's some there's a lot of inconsistency in college basketball. And uh, as a result of that, you're going to get uh, a lot of teams that are hard to figure. And maybe Arizona on a national scale can take advantage of that a little bit. But being successful in Utah and Colorado obviously uh, plays to that to some degree. To Ben's point and to the other folks who are talking about uh, – uh, Arizona's three-point shooting and 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 Hanson's reference to Arizona being an attacking team as opposed to a three-point shooting team. We talked about this a couple nights ago uh, in the statistical uh, capacity aspect, and Arizona shot 24 three-pointers. And that, that to me, that I I know that there's analytics yeah. out there, and I know that yeah, they, those suck. Though. Know, those analytics suck. That's and that's what I think. Uh, and and I think if Arizona is shooting 24 three-pointers, that's a problem. Uh, this is not the way that that team is built, and they ought to be able to do some things to put more pressure 
uh, on defensive teams. And if they're shooting from three, they're settling. And I think part of the problem here is, and, and, and we don't necessarily see it when it happens, but I think this team misses Tabella so much. A guy on the inside who can just pass the ball and instead of just doing a move on the inside, the which he can do, right, yeah. yeah, then the, he, he can also find an open guy and that maybe motivates. And I wish it wasn't a motivating factor because, and, and Mike, you and I have talked about this a fair amount in regards to whatever the Caleb Love issue is. There are two schools of thought probably with Love. You know, if Love's holding on to the ball, you kind of get uh, hypnotized by watching what it is that Love does, but you're not helping by not moving without the ball. Right. Uh, so, so you have a lot of guys on this roster who kind of just find a spot beyond three point line and just kind of stay there. And Arizona is a team. A lot of teams fall into this category, but Arizona should be a team that is a lot better moving without the ball. And if you can get that sort of thing going on a more consistent basis, you would hope that Arizona could be a little bit more effective offensively. You look at their overall numbers and you like what you see because Arizona's what in the top 10 overall from a point standpoint and the rest of it. But there are, I don't think they're nearly as efficient consistently as they have an opportunity uh, uh, to be on a regular basis. And I think there are things they can do uh, to fix it. But question to you guys, how many, how many players on this team can pass the ball well? Not not the two guys on the inside. Um, I, I mean, yeah, I know they have a lot of a really, really good point. Yeah. Uh, but Kobe, Kobe, Kobe if, Thiel, if you, our, our guy makes a great point. By the way, he always says shoe is a legend. Shoe is a legend. Um, well, it must be the, the legend of shoe. Um, but uh, I was saying that on Twitter, Zoo's passing made Ballo so much better. Ballo was able to like, especially the high low. You really had to respect when you had, uh, excuse me, when you had Tabellus and when you had Ballo. You don't really have to respect it in the same way that you did with Keyshaw Johnson. Yeah, or yeah. a number of players. I'm sorry, Ben. A number of other Go players ahead. on the roster is too. There's a little bit of stagnation to Arizona's offense. Completely, like. completely. And I think when you have somebody like Love, as as good as he is, and as much as this team has need him, has needed him. And don't get me wrong. Like when I'm talking, when it comes to Love, I'm not necessarily saying he's an issue for this team, right? That's not what I'm saying at all. But I think the guard play, I mean, outside of Larson, right? But he kind of is what he is, right? But he's just gotten more time this year. But collectively, the guard play, I feel like, has has regressed this year. Um, the ball movement isn't there. Offensively, the team just isn't as consistent. Defensively, they've taken a huge step back. Um, that's something that we never had conversations about in yeah. Lloyd's first couple of years. And, and this year, it just seems like game after game at times, the defense does tend to get worse. And you talk about adjustments and you talk about all these things, but it doesn't matter if the guys aren't going to give the effort. And it just seems like an effort thing at times. And I'm not sure why it's not clicking with this team at this point in the year because it's not getting any easier. We're a month and a half away from the NCAA tournament. This isn't a position where you want to be. And yeah, to Shoe's point earlier, yeah, if you're a guard on Arizona, it's kind of hard to, I think, really see just what you're trying to do offensively, possession after possession. There's nothing really fluid, it seems, recently with this offense because... Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you saw that early in the year. You saw it last year where obviously you get the ball into to, uh, to Bellis and he, he gets the ball to Ballo and obviously the guards move the ball around the perimeter. But you don't really see that. I mean, Love's taking it down, you know, making things happen himself. Boswell's trying to shoot a force three or he's got a wide open spot up shot that he's passing up on. And it's just, it, you know, it's air after air, right? And I just think this offense needs to be a little bit more crisp. And there's a lot of cleaning up to do, I think, if you're going to make noise in the tournament. And this offense isn't efficient. And that's what we saw from Lloyd, you know, early on the last couple of years is the offense was always smooth. There was always some some flu fluidity to fluidity to it. Excuse me. Um, but but this year you haven't really seen that. And I think when you bring in somebody like Love, it is good and bad because it makes things hard offensively um, when you're trying to be a little bit more balanced and get a number of different guys involved uh, just because of the type of player he is. OK, now. Um, the Phoenix, Phoenix Raceway, John Schuster, you strike me as somebody that in your spare time, you go to Phoenix Raceway. This is correct. Oh, you absolutely know that. You know, my, uh, redneck background, you know, I'm all about the Phoenix Raceway. 
No, the Phoenix Raceway is all kinds of fun. Get your tickets to the Shriners Children's 500 at Phoenix Raceway. March 8th to the 10th promises a weekend of good vibes for the whole family. Get your tickets now at phoenixraceway.com. Jacob Franklin, many people ask me, is Jacob Franklin, is he somebody that is uh, into a uh, race car or is, is it called race? No, it's not called race yeah, car. Yeah, it's called race car. Yeah, that, that, that's what it's called, Mike. It's called race car. Yes, I. you know, when you're hanging out with A.J. Foyt and Richard Petty and uh, Mongoose and Snake on the drag strip, they call it race car. Yes, race you car. got it. You got that right. Mm-hmm. Race car. Did you also know that race car is a palindrome. It is. Yo, you're right. It, it kind of is. It not not as a it's not kind of. It is. Of it's, but is race car two words or one? Everybody out there is race car one word or two words? Because if it's two words, does that count? Um, though that is the big question of the night. Probably the uh, Mike Luke. You might have actually backed on your way out of this one. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. About- well, I, I don't know. I'm just curious. I don't know what the palindrome rules are, Mike. Luke. It's it's one word. Oh, thank Jacob you, Jacob Franklin. Franklin. Here, Jacob it's Franklin. one word. Therefore, it is a palindrome, and that is what we call the sport. We call it race car, just as Mike Luke announced. So did Phoenix Raceway, Mike book? Luke. Did I ever tell you about the book that when I was in elementary school that I had to read like 30 times called uh, 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 Hannah is a Palindrome? Hmm. That's the, the, the title's correct. Was it a good book? Would it you recommend it on this show? It was but, a crappy book, but you had to read it 30 times. But the antagonist, though, was a guy uh, that would always make fun of Hannah uh, and would say Hannah is a palindrome and would make was fun his name of Bob? her the whole time. Guess what his name was? And at the end of the book, it came back to bite him in the uh, in the uh, the rear end. Was it Bob? It was Otto. Oh, no, no <laughs> sweet. It wasn't Ray. At least it wasn't race well, car. She thought at the end, she said, watch this. She called and Then she said at the end, well, Otto is a palindrome. And he was oh, devastated. Woo! Did you do a book report on it? I don't know. Big spoiler in that title. Hannah is a palindrome. <laughs> but um, Otto. Yeah, but it was Otto, though. Otto is a palindrome. Um, My niece's name is Hannah. My niece's name is not Otto. Oh, we need to talk about ASU for a second. Yeah, we need to make fun of ASU. Matt Ritson, uh, 499 Super Snap. Um, do you think that ASU's basketball coach is on the hot seat if they get swept by uh, uh, Calford? Um, all right, let's just assume they get swept. Where, where are we with Bobby? Where are we with Bobby Hurley? And Jacob Franklin, you hop in here as well. Um, where are we with Bobby Hurley? Uh, what do you think, John Schuster? And you, Ben One White. I mean, I don't know. They're athletic. They they. That's about the best thing I can say about them. I don't know. I don't <laughs> yeah. know who you're – the deal at ASU, and I don't know if Hurley's the guy or some other guy is is involved. But ASU has to figure out how to be innovative and imaginative from an NIL standpoint. Now that the opportunity is there, that's helpful. They have the East Valley's got a crap load of money. Uh, So if that's something that they can tap into some way to get some better uh, players in there, that I think is the option that's probably more viable than whoever's coaching that program. Do you think that – I've always thought that with uh, – and I think it's a rare good comparison that I've come up with over the years, and I'm always going to use this. So bear with me. Mike Stoops and Bob Stoops. One of them clearly got most of the uh, the matter up here. Uh, that was not Mike Stoops. That was Bob Stoops. I watched Danny Bummer. Hurley and I watched Bobby Hurley, and I think it's the exact same thing. One guy got all of it. The other guy got none of it. What say you, Ben One White? Look, I, to Shu's point, um, the NIL thing would help them, but I think they really have to decide what kind of program they want to be or are they really going to change at that point? And you have to ask yourself, how much better can we do? If Bobby Hurley is not the answer, who is? But I'll say this much. If I'm Bobby Hurley, I'm trying to get out now because I do not want to go to the Big 12. Oh, I guess you in the Big 12 is all kinds of fun. Jacob That's Franklin, hop in. I'm yeah. adding Jacob Franklin. Jacob Franklin, you've been added. Um. Jacob Franklin, what do you what do you think about uh, Bobby Hurley? Where are you at? Jacob Franklin, get back in here. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's what that's what most people think about ASU men's basketball. He's in the stream with audio. He keeps uh, removing himself. He doesn't want to talk about it. <laughs> All right, but um, yeah, Bobby Hurley. It's just weird, but uh, I. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't have a lot of faith in that uh, ASU basketball going into the Big 12. I think that's going to be a, a very difficult uh, proposition. All right, but 
On that note, Ella, hey, uh, they stink. Oh, that's Jacob Franklin right there. That's not, there's your answer. <laughs> yeah, Jacob Franklin earlier in the year also uh, was also saying that Mike, don't you think that ASU might be a little bit better than Arizona? You did say this, Jacob Franklin. You did say this, Jacob Franklin. Out of curiosity, since we're on this topic, uh, is there a coach out there who you think might be yes. more big? Big 12 suited that could be beneficial for ASU's you know transition into the next conference. You know who the rumor is? Uh, no. D- is it a palindrome? Think about it. It's not a palindrome. Who's somebody that everybody hates? Um, <laughs> you and I like, and he's very entertaining to watch, and he's pretty successful. He wins everywhere he goes. Hmm. Eric Musselman. <laughs> what? Yep. 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 The must bus. Huh? Yep. 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 Here's the what's problem happening is he'll never leave bus. where he is now for that. But yes, he would be fantastic. Here's what's happening with the must bus. And you know, somebody that knows the must bus and he could probably vouch for this. Must is the man like muscle, but must also has a shelf life everywhere he goes. Must must is about a five to a six year type dude. Um, then after a while, uh, he kind of wears out his welcome. There are rumors that he has reached out to ASU about the head coaching position. <laughs> he would be a home run hire. He would be taking his shirt off left and right. Uh, ASU, I'll put it to you like this. People would be there. People would go to the games if Eric Musselman was the coach. Yeah, those th- those statements are certainly accurate. I'm fascinated that that is a choice that uh, would be available, but Hey, if it is, it'd be hard to pass up. Would you? That's my you would input. hire him though, correct, John Schuster? I, 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 I think that would be that. That'd be. You'd better be <laughs> absolutely sure that is the case, because it, it, you know, because Hurley's good enough to be good enough. But if you're absolutely, you absolutely know that some guy of Musselman's caliber is available, you make that move. But if you botch that, then <laughs> now, now who are you going to hire? Kevin uh, O'Neill. <laughs> is Bob Evans still alive? The uh, owner of the restaurants? No, 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 no. The XA is too coach. I thought too. I was like, what? <laughs> no, is Bob Evans still oh, no, alive? The, the restaurants are pretty good. <laughs> haven't ha- I haven't been to a Bob Evans in a while. No, but you don't, I don't know. Mike, I don't know. You remember him though. I do remember Evans, yes. Okay. Not a lot of um, ASU fans would like to remember Evans, but you know, some of us do have a recollection of Evans, yes. That's the, and bit. the restaurant. I also do remember the restaurant. Yes. All right. TJ, you're right. Jacob Franklin is a wuss, but without Jacob Franklin, the show doesn't occur. Okay. On that note though, we appreciate all of you, Ben White, the professionalism you show in the face of chaos and a storm of nonsense is remarkable. John Schuster, you bring yourself. You got snuffy in the background. I like all the orange. I am Mike Luke. I'm going to have a new background set up tomorrow. I know that you guys are all going to be excited about the new. Will background. it be orange? Moving studios. Yep. Yeah. Studio. I did not. I had nothing to do with it. Um. I don't know how to do anything. I don't know how to put a desk together. Um. I don't know how to do anything. So everything you see will have not been done by me. On that note. All right. Back to freaking a, y'all. We agree. Oh yeah. Shout out to Scott Schlittenhart. Um, we're going to show this tattoo tomorrow, but uh, Scott Schlittenhart, the first one on record, to my knowledge, the great Scott Schlittenhart, of uh, that ha- has a back the A tattoo. We are going to talk about this. We are going to break it down, and we are going to ask who's next in the back the A tattoo movement. But for John Schuster, Ben One White, Jacob Franklin, I am merely Mike Luke. You have been listening to the AZ Wildcats post game. We all silly like the mayor. 